Good morning, church. Good morning, church. There we go. We're going to be a little informal this morning, folks. And uh, I'm so glad to be back with you all. I've missed you. And, um, and it's, uh, it's hard to be away from the body of Christ, especially as we know that things have changed. Things are a little different now with this coronavirus issue. And, and if you've been to Walmart recently or Albertsons, you know that uh, things are going quickly. I was shocked. I saw that things were being taken and just gone from the shelves. The one that shocked me was the Coke. People were grabbing flour, toilet paper, and Coke. I don't know why it's needed so much right now. I did find a verse for us about this whole issue from Psalm 26, 6. I shall wash my hands in innocence. And I will go about your altar, O Lord. I like that. I'll wash my hands in innocence. Of course, it's talking about my own life and, and my life before God. And I won't stop coming before your altar. So thanks for coming today. Uh, we are here to praise the Lord. And it's a little emotional because I don't know when we're going to get together again. A lot of churches have closed right now. There are churches in our community that are not meeting today. And so we'll see what happens. Uh, we're going to meet this Tuesday as elders to decide what next Sunday is going to look like. And uh, if you look around, you know there's already a lot of people who have stayed home. And so please be aware of, of what's happening. The best way to stay in tune is to get on our Facebook page and become a member. So you have to ask to, you have to, ask to be part of it, and then we'll go ahead and accept you if you're part of the church. Or get on the email prayer chain. On the email prayer chain, both that and Facebook will keep sending messages throughout this week and then the weeks to come about what's going on. But please pray for us as leaders in the church, as staff and elders, because we don't want to stop ministering, though we may not be able to continue meeting. We don't really know exactly what's going to happen uh, the next few weeks, but please pray for us as we seek to up our game in ministering to one another, or caring for one another, caring for the sick, praying for one another. Uh, we just would ask for you to pray for us about that. And if you do find yourselves in any kind of immune-suppressed uh, situation in your life, feel free to just self-quarantine yourself. No matter what decisions we make the next month or so, just be aware that um, it's something that, that you should just be really cautious of. So we're glad we're here today because we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we do know that we're here together today to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. And so welcome. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to worship the Lord. We've got baptisms this morning. We've got songs to the Lord. We've got his word, and uh, we will be edified. So why don't we stand up and say the verse of the month together? Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. You may be seated. Well, we're, I'm going to pray in opening this morning. And I thought appropriate to pray Psalm 30 because I think it really applies to us today. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies rejoice over me. O oh Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive, that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment. Your favor, Lord, is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now as for me... I've said in my prosperity, I will never be moved. O oh Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain to stand strong. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O oh Lord, I called, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your faithfulness? Hear, O oh Lord, and be gracious to me. O oh Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me, my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. That my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you. 
forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Now it's time for some announcements. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> Again, welcome. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be worshiping and hearing the word and praying together. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, if you're a first-time visitor, we are really glad you're here. And uh, certainly we'd like to know there's a yellow communication card there uh, in, your, in the pew in front of you. You can fill that out. You can also check at our info booth. Um, for any information you may need. Uh, and as Pastor said, concerning our ongoing, our Facebook and uh, prayer chain will continue to update. I also think there'll be updates on our website so uh, you can see what's happening in the future. A um, couple of quick announcements. Um, we are doing a new uh, photo directory. And so uh, Richard Bishop is set up in the chapel back here. And after the service, you can slip in there and he can take your picture. Uh, I'm not sure how many, how many we'll be able to get today, but as we have opportunity in the future, we'll uh, continue to get pictures and put together our directory. Um, there is no children's church today, uh, so it's kind of like a communion Sunday where the children will stay with us here in, in the sanctuary for the service. Um, I'm kind of skimming through here. Um, Love, Inc. This is Love, Inc. month. And so uh, we support Love, Inc. in so many ways, but it, as far as Love, Inc. this month, they have some particular physical needs, and these include uh, paper towels, dish soap, laundry detergent, all-purpose cleaner, men's deodorant, and $10 gas cards. You'll see some big buckets on the table about here. Uh, you can bring those in during the week or whenever and put them there, and we'll get those to Love, Inc. so that they can... Uh, benefit from the use of those. Also, if you came in, you might have seen a table back here of some Bibles. Uh, I've talked about that for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we use the ESV. You'll find the ESV translation in your pew. It's what we teach. It's what we preach from. And so if you're looking for an ESV Bible, maybe you have another translation. And unfortunately, we don't have a bookstore in the area. So uh, we do have some Bibles out here that you can purchase at a special 60 or 65 percent discount. Basically, it's not a fundraiser. It's not a for profit. It's just basically at my cost as a as a, a dealer, and we just want to make them available at the lowest cost possible. It is a time where you can order any Bible in ESV at 50 percent off, including tax, and then we just order them and we get those in. So if that's of interest to you, if you've kind of procrastinated and you wanted to do something like that, I'll be back there and help. A helpful to answer any questions you have. It's always nice to have a, a quality Bible that uh, encourages you to get into the Word even more. Um, a last word, if you were here last Sunday or you listened to the message, we talked about waiting rooms. And who would have anticipated, because we're all in a waiting room to now. We have no idea how long this is going to last. We have no idea exactly how it's going to end. And yet, Paul was in a similar situation, and what did he do? He said, I can't control that. What I can control is being used by God to advance the gospel, to share Christ. So we can't control all of this. We can make good choices and wisdom, but we can always share Christ. And probably right now, more than ever, our neighbors and others that we come across need to hear about Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. This morning we have two baptisms, Ty and Brittany Huddleston, and uh, I had the privilege of doing their wedding last September. And as we were going through marriage counseling and we were talking, I was getting to know them and they were sharing their faith with me, uh, we were, got to talk and, and I asked them, have you guys been baptized? And they said, as a matter of fact, no. And uh, so they ha they've been Christians for quite some time, uh, but haven't yet taken that step of baptism. And so they are happy to come and to take part in baptism and, and make this step of faith here 
this morning. So uh, it, it, as you know, baptism, when we talk about this often as a church, that it's a symbol of an inward reality, but it's a part of obedience to Christ because Jesus told us to go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so they're here to do that today and declare his praises. So Ty is going to get, go ahead and go first and tell us about his faith. My name is Ty, and like many of you, I grew up in a Christian home. I'm so thankful that I did, too, because I know I would have gone astray without guidance early on in my life. Though I don't remember the exact day I asked Jesus into my life, I have a very clear memory of one evening just being super miserable, and I remember asking the Lord to give me patience and joy in my life. Today I know he still does, and he reminds me every day of Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Ty, based upon your profession, I want to ask you two questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. And do you wish to follow him in the waters of baptism? I do. Okay. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. My name is Brittany, and I grew up in a Christian family. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was nine years old. However, despite this upbringing, I was a rebellious teenager who rejected God. During my teenage years, I started to attend a local dance group for homeschoolers and Christian families. The main focus was glorifying God through dance. However, my main reason for attending was to be with my friends and not to glorify God. One of my teachers um, was an amazing example of God's love and lived her life to glorify him. I could not understand at the time how she was so happy and content. I wanted to know how I could have that life again. This was the beginning of my journey back to God. I'm still learning and growing in my walk with him, and I'm by no means perfect. I'm so excited to be sharing this moment with everyone today. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Brittany, based upon your confession, I'm going to ask you two questions, the same ones. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. And do you wish to follow him in the waters of baptism? I do. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, raised to new life. Why don't we pray for them? Heavenly Father, we want to pray for Ty and Brittany, Lord. I pray that you would guide them all the days of their life as they seek to follow you and grow in their discipleship. You have called them to follow, Lord, and they have desired to do so. And so we pray that you would unite them to you more and more each day, bring in them sanctification, and bring them closer to holiness in you. And Lord, we pray that we as a church would, would be able to help them and, and come alongside them, Lord, as people who love them and care for them and want to see uh, your work greatly working in their lives. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us, church, as we sing to our God? Uh, it's a, I love it whenever we have opportunities to, to make our faith real and whenever the community um, needs peace, just like our, our verse of the month needs uh, true power from the, the one source that it comes from, our God, our everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. You do not faint. You don't go weary. You are the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. We're singing from the book of Psalms. There's even some clapping in this one. Look out. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not fade, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You 
comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Do not fail, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like you eagles. Are. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. church let's continue from the book of psalm 46 the lord of hosts oh come behold the works of god the nations at his feet he breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease almighty oh, one of israel you are on our side we walk by faith in god who burns the chariots with fire Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Jacob, fierce and great, you lift your voice to speak. The earth that bows and all the mountains move into the sea. O oh Lord, you know the hearts of men, and still you let them live. O oh God, who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us and win. O oh God, who makes the mountains melt, Come wrestle me and win. And Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go but with the Lord? I know my God is in control. The oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God. 
God is in control. And Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest Thank you, Lord, for the chance to come this morning. We get to sing together. We get to give praise to our God. We get to spend time in his word. Ah, our Christian's daily prayer. God, my source of strength, in you I live and breathe. Each hour is yours by wisdom plan, each deed empowered by sovereign hands. Renew my spirit, help me stand, be glorified today. I seek your will in all of life's demands. And though the tempter tries me still, I cling to your commands. Let every effort of my life display the matchless worth of Christ. Make me a be glorified today as sun gives way to darkest night your spirit still is here and though my strength fades like the night New mercies will appear. I rest in you, abide with me until our trials and suffering give way to final victory. Be glorified today. I rest in you, abide with me until. Trials and sufferings give way to final victory. Be glorified today. Be glorified, I pray. Father, you are the reason we are here, uh, the reason that we can have peace, that we do not um, exist in fear or anger, Father, but we rest in your sovereign, holy hands, Father. Thank you so much for the opportunity to sing to you and worship you this morning in your name. This last song, you guys have heard a few times, Holy, Holy, Holy. 
Um, Daniel, if you can put up the new chorus, there's a really lovely chorus we're going to teach to you guys in between um, verse 3 and 4. It's, I bow before thee. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Maybe. <laughs> Here we go. Yay. There we go. The first one is I bow. It should be I bow. That's the last verse. It changes. I bow and then I stand. Maybe I'm asking. <laughs> anyway. There it is. There it is. I bow before thee, King of glory. Holy are you, Lord. None beside thee. Perfect in power. My God forever. You were and are and you will be. So after verse 3, we're going to sing that through two times. So if the first time through you want to listen and figure out how it goes, and we'll tag that and sing it again, and you can jump right in with us. But uh, it's just regular old, not regular old, it's wonderful old, <laughs> holy, holy, holy until then. Here we go.
Pastor Brett comes and opens your word. Lord, I pray that our, our hearts would be soft, minds open to what it is that you would have us not only here today, Father, but to put into action for your kingdom this week, that the, the community around us would see uh, joy on our faces because we are not, um, we are aliens and strangers in this world, that we have eternal things in mind, and that uh, Father, that you are our king and that the gospel is ever on our lips and in our actions. Thank you for being our holy Lord and that you are and will be and that you are worthy of praise and glory. Precious Father, we thank you this morning. In your precious name, amen. Well, if you take out your Bibles this morning and open up to the book of Acts, chapter 21. It is such a joy to be able to sing together. And it's, in my mind, a piece of heaven. Just a slice, getting us ready for our future that we will have forever with Christ. We continue to think about our future and what we have in Jesus By looking at Acts chapter 21, we're looking today at verses 1 through 16, and I'm going to go ahead and read them. Actually, uh, Pastor John said that uh, we use the ESV, but I lost my ESV uh, today, and so I have an NAS today. So you're going to notice a little bit of difference, but it's just because I lost my ESV today. When we had parted from them and set sail, we ran a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. And they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. 
When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. Then we had, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Nason of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to launch. As we look at discerning God's will, we see this passage with all kinds of interesting twists and turns. As we continue the story of the Apostle Paul and his return to Jerusalem to end his third missionary journey. And the issue of discerning God's will is replete throughout this passage. And it's here in this word of God for us today that I believe this is the Lord's message for us in such a time as this to know what God's will is. And so if you have your bulletin or you have a piece of paper uh, or you just want to think about this, I have two questions I really want to ask you this morning. And I would ask you to consider those questions throughout this whole time. And here's the first question. What is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? Write down the answer to that question. What is God's will for your life right now? Second question. How has God directed me to accomplish his will? How has God directed me to accomplish his will for my life? Go ahead and write down the answer. Think about the answer. You see, we all as Christians, have a calling, something God has called us to do. And it's very different for many of us. Of course, there's a general calling, which is make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But God has a specific role for you to live in this life. There is a reason why when you became a Christian and the great question of your life was answered, you were given eternal life, that God has kept you here on this earth. And he's kept me here on this earth. So what is that? Do you know? And as you look at the question, or if you thought about it, do you have that answer? What is God's will for your life? Do you have something written down? I hope you were able to write something down quickly, because you know this is why God has left me on this earth. This is what I am to do, because God has shown me what it is. And secondly, the second question answered, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do to accomplish that will. This is what I am supposed to be doing as I live my life. Every Christian should be able to answer that question. And if you're here today and you don't really know what to write down, it's time to pray, isn't it? Because the Lord will show you what his will is. God is in the business of directing us. He is sovereign. That means that that he knows the future and and he's deciding the future and he's leading it and guiding it. And he has a will for you. And he wants you to even use his plan for you this week as people are are really getting nervous about the coronavirus and all these different things going on. God has a plan for you. He wants to use you this week. The question is, 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 are we ready to be used in his general will for our lives today? You see, it's very important to know God's will for our lives. 
Because when we know God's will for our lives and how to accomplish it, you see, we will have a purpose in life that rises above the mundane living that we normally experience. In other words, God has a higher purpose for you than survival. And when you have a higher purpose than survival, survival becomes less important. And here's the good news, brothers and sisters. The issue of survival, making it in life, has been resolved if you know Jesus Christ. Amen? Your eternal life is secure. No one can take it from you. Though your body may be killed, you will live on. And guess what? You get a new body. And it's better than the one you have now. So this, the issue of survival and surviving in life is solved by eternal life in Christ. That's why he came to die, so that you may live and have life and have it abundantly. And as Jesus said, you will never truly die because you'll be alive with Christ for all eternity. So if that issue is solved, the question is, what is the purpose of my living? What is the purpose of me being here? And when we know that survival is not our primary aim, then doing the will of God is, right? So it's a wonderful thing when we can take survival off the table and say, that issue is finalized. It is finished. Now, what does God have for me beyond? Something supernatural, something, something that is in God's sovereign plan throughout all eternity, that God is fulfilling his story of redeeming the creation through Christ, and he is using you as his tools to spread the gospel. And as we took, look to the story today, no one really displays this truth, aside from Jesus, better than the Apostle Paul. Take a look at the chapter previous, chapter 20, verse 22. Listen to how Paul sees himself as he has the issue of death resolved, and he wants to do the will of God above life itself. Chapter 20, verse 22. As Paul was talking to the Ephesian elders and he was on his way to Jerusalem, this is what he says. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Now just hold on there for a second. Notice what he's saying. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going in the will of God. And I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm going to go anyways. Verse 23. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. He knows that there's something bad coming. He's going anyway, and then verse 24, he tells us why. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. What is Paul's ultimate desire? that he will fulfill the will of God in his life to such a degree that his own life is not as important as fulfilling the will of God. This issue with, with him was settled long ago when he had an experience with Jesus on the road and his life was redeemed and now he said, Lord, my life is yours. Do with it what you will. I am a living sacrifice. Now, a lot of people wouldn't answer going into a dangerous situation, a situation where they knew by the Spirit that they were going to be in danger, they wouldn't go. But Paul lived for different reasons than a lot of people do. He wasn't as concerned about survival as he was about doing the will of God. You know, many years ago, uh, I, I looked into becoming a pastor, and I, I, I really resisted it. When God called me into the pastorate, at first I said, no, Lord. And I started talking to other pastors and one thing they, they told me, which I think is really good advice for anybody who wants to get involved in, in eldering, is, he, is they've said this, if you don't feel called into preaching, then don't do it, because there are difficulties and hardships that come with it where your calling is the only thing that will keep you in the pulpit. Because circumstances will change, life will change, and you may be w wanting to quit, but what will keep you there is the will of God. If you know that that is the will of God for you, you know that if he calls you to it, he'll see you through it. It's good advice. And it's true for all of us. That, that God, when he calls you to do something, that's the greatest calling you could ever have. And he has called you to do something. 
The question is, how do you know what thing that is? And that's what we're looking at this morning. So I want you to know that as we get to the end of Paul's third missionary journey, that this story has now made a full circle. We see here numerous parts of this story where Paul is actually going back to the beginning. It's kind of like playing a country song backwards. When you play a country song backwards, what do you get? What do you hear? You get your wife back, your house back, and your dog back. This is going backwards into Paul's life. Notice what happens. He's heading to Jerusalem. He goes down and he gets to Caesarea on his way there. And he meets some interesting people, people that are connected to the past. You see, he's headed back to Jerusalem, which is the place he had started as a Pharisee where he was persecuting Christians. Now he's heading back there as a redeemed saint of God. And as a new Christian, he had been supported in his mission by the church of Jerusalem, and now he's come full circle, and he's now coming back there to Jerusalem. And he's coming to, on his way, to the city of Caesarea. And this is where he had already come at the end of his second missionary journey. So he's coming back again to a place he's already come at the end of another missionary journey. And then in Caesarea, he stays in the house of Philip. Now notice, Philip is in Caesarea because he started out in Jerusalem but had to leave because of the persecution of Paul. Paul was persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem. Philip left to go evangelize and he ended up in Caesarea. Now Paul is staying with Philip in Caesarea. Now Philip is hosting Paul when he had been running from him. And the Holy Spirit has sent Paul away. Now the Holy Spirit was telling him, go back. Go back to Jerusalem. So we see here this full circle where where Paul's almost going back to these old connections that he has in his past as he's going back because he's about to be, as you know, captured and put in prison. And so he's meeting these people that he has impacted as he has been redeemed. And so as the story unfolds, we look at three things to remember when discerning God's will. The first is this. Warnings are not necessarily prohibitions. Warnings by God is not necessarily a prohibition to do his will. Let's take a look at verses 1 through 3. This is, this is a, 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 de, a detailed uh, list of what they did because, of course, Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us a detailed look at what it was like to be a seafarer at that time and travel by boat. And it mentions three Ports along the coast of Asia Minor. Verse 1, it says, uh, When we had parted from them and set sail, we ran straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. So these are three cities along Asia Minor. They're going along day after day, just going and stopping at ports on their way to Jerusalem, but they're way over in what is now Turkey. And then, verse 2, And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, which most people think was a much larger ship, a seafaring ship, they went aboard and set sail. So they got on this ship, and they were heading across the Mediterranean Sea over to the modern-day Middle East. Verse 3, when we came in the site of Cyprus, so they see this island, they kept going, leaving it on the left. We kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And so in Tyre, they stop, and they have made now a 400-mile journey, which typically took about five days at that time. And so Tyre was now a natural place to unload the cargo because this is a cargo ship and a passenger ship. And so they're there, and they're unloading it. And while at Tyre, Paul joins up for seven days with a church. Take a look at verse 4. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. And they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days were... There were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all with wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home again. So it's very interesting that that Paul most likely had never been to this church before, but they look up this church and in a seven day period of time, Paul established such a good relationship with these new Christians. This is the wonderful thing about the church of God, isn't it? You can go anywhere and have an instant connection with other Christians. He makes such a wonderful connection with this, these Christians in seven days that they escort him to the ship and, and they kneel and pray together because they love him so much. They've come to love him in just a few days. And, and it tells us that they have a, a concern for Paul that is given to them by the Holy Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. They're saying, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. 
But it tells us that Paul was not deterred from going on his journey, and he decided to keep going, which is a very curious thing. If somebody's being prodded by the Holy Spirit to not have you not do something, why would Paul then want to do it? And so grieved, the people from the boat come, and a whole family is actually accompanying him to the boat. One of the few times that a whole family is described in the book of Acts. It's wonderful. Wives and children all came with uh, them and to see Paul off. An interesting thing is they get down there and they pray. They pray with true affection. They pray for concern for Paul. They feel like something bad is going to happen to him by the Spirit. And it says they kneel to pray, which is a very interesting thing. If you notice in the Bible, the, the accounts of the early church tell us how they worshiped. And this is interesting that they knelt down and, to pray. And so that's not a modern idea. That's a very old idea to kneel down to pray. And it's fascinating because Jesus actually said in Mark 11 that, that while you stand praying, forgive other people so that your prayers might be answered, Mark 11, 25. And so standing while we pray or kneeling while we pray is all appropriate uh, forms of prayer and, and, and attitudes of prayer. So just some interesting uh, concepts in the New Testament about the different varieties with which people pray. I can imagine that they, they get down on their knees because they are bowing in submission to the Lord. They are in submission to his will. Wonderful picture. But the question is, why did Paul not heed their warning? Why did Paul, hearing them say, well, don't go, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, we're concerned for your life, says, eh, I'm going anyways. Unless we deduce that Paul was disobedient, which some people think he was, that, that the Spirit was saying, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, and he says, Lord, I'm just going to go. Then we have to deduce that he is actually following God's will, and they are misunderstanding God's will. And we know that Paul was not in the habit of disobeying God's will, was he? We know that when he wanted to go to Asia Minor, the Holy Spirit prevented him. And so he went another way, the Holy Spirit prevented him, and he listened to the Holy Spirit. And, and he went eventually to Macedonia. So Paul is not in the habit of disobeying the Lord. So something interesting is going on here. And that is this. Sometimes God gives us warnings about something he wants us to do, not necessarily to stop us, but to prepare us. Sometimes God gives us a warning about his will, not to stop you, but to prepare you, to get you ready for what's to come. Because brothers and sisters, one thing we can know about the will of God is it most likely will not be easy. I've rarely met a saint in the church who said, you know, when I started following the will of the Lord, life just got so much easier. It, it's more difficult. You see, Paul knew and said in chapter 20, verse 22, which we read, that the Holy Spirit compelled him to go to Jerusalem. He knew that God had called him to go to Jerusalem, but yet he also knew that the Spirit was prodding these people to warn him. So he knew they weren't saying, don't go to Jerusalem. What he knew was that he was being warned to prepare himself because there was some difficult times ahead. You see, following God's will may come with warnings, but it mean, it's a means of preparing us. You know, sometimes when we hear the will of God and God calls us to something, we immediately think this question. Lord, what are the risks involved? Lord, what am I going to have to sacrifice? Lord, am I going to have to sacrifice money? I've seen people not want to do the will of the Lord because they didn't pay enough. How, uh, do, we, do, we, do we get concerned about the health? Do we get concerned about... Uh, the, the, the risks of, of perhaps losing face? Do we ask questions about the risks? The message here is the risks don't necessarily determine whether or not we should do something in the will of God. Because there is no promise that if you do the will of God that you won't have risks. As a matter of fact, God is saying you are risking something when you step out into the will of God. And so God does not want you to be unprepared. He wants to send you out potentially into danger, but he wants you to be prepared for it. You know, um, it's interesting. I, I get the privilege of doing a lot of marriage, uh, premarital counseling. And I find myself in this role numerous times with couples, especially if the couple comes from different cultures. If a, if a man and a woman are wanting to get married, but they come from different cultures, ethnicities, uh, I oftentimes will tell them, about those cultures and ethnicities, that they need to be prepared for what difference this is going to be because this is going to be a difference that they're, it's a big difference that they're going to have to adjust to. And I tell them, I say, this, I'm not saying you shouldn't get married. You should get married because God has called you to this marriage. And they've told me this. 
But the thing is, is you need to be prepared so that you will stick with it when you hit hard times, so that you will bear down and not say, well, I wasn't prepared for this. I didn't see this one coming. You can see things oftentimes in premarital counseling that are on the horizon, and, 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 some, and sometimes it's very appropriate to give a warning, but not to dissuade people from it and say, look, I just want you to know when you get married in this situation, you're going to encounter some differences, and you need to be prepared for that. And God is in the business of doing that in our own life. Sometimes he brings along somebody in your life that's going to warn you about something. It doesn't necessarily mean you're not to do it. It means be prepared. Be well informed so that you may be able to adjust. Second point, future pain and death should not necessarily be avoided. This is a tough one. If God calls you, future pain and death may be part of the deal. It's just a natural part of serving the Lord. Take a look at verse 7. And when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. So Ptolemais is this short stop. It's five miles south of Tyre. And there in Ptolemais, they actually found a church. And interestingly, it probably was a church founded by people who had been persecuted by Paul. Isn't that interesting? Because when Paul had persecuted uh, the Hellenists, they spread out through the western side of Israel and the north. And so most likely these people were actually formed as a church because Paul was persecuting them. Now he's fellowshipping with them, coming first full circle. And take a look at verse 8. On the next day we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now Philip had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Remember back, Philip was one of the first people called out another man who was called out by the will of God, as one of the seven. One of the seven when the apostles said, if we're too busy waiting on tables, then we will not be able to do the ministry of preaching and prayer. So we're going to set aside seven men to go and be people who wait on tables. And Philip was one of them. Isn't that wonderful? That seems like a long time ago. And remember that he's the man who, when he was persecuted, went to the Samaritans and preached the gospel to the Samaritans. And there was a revival amongst the Samaritans, and the Holy Spirit was moving amongst them, and they were getting saved. And then we found Philip down uh, in the southern part of Israel, and he encounters a, a eunuch, right, from Ethiopia. And he goes and he baptizes the man who had believed in Jesus Christ. And when he had um, come out of the water, Philip was gone. And the text tells us that Philip appeared on the coast of Israel and then started heading north. And the last place it tells us he was was Caesarea, where he ended up, he got married, he had kids, four daughters, and here he is in Caesarea. Now this is a curious detail. For some reason, Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wanted to tell us that he had four daughters. They were virgins, which means they were unmarried, they were single, and they were prophetesses. Now it doesn't tell us that they made any prophecies at this point. All it tells us is that there was prophetesses. And that's it. It just leaves it there. And it brings up a curious question for us. Um, what role did prophetesses have in the early church? Well, Luke has actually mentioned prophetesses, that is, ladies who are prophesying in the Lord, uh, in the book of Luke, in chapter 2, uh, about a prophetess named Anna. And Anna had prophesied about the birth of Jesus. And then in Peter's first sermon in Acts, also written by Luke, Paul's, or Peter's first sermon, he says, from Joel, quotes, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And then we see in 1 Corinthians 11.5, Paul was writing, he says, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. So there was, there was wives who were prophesying. And so there's this picture that, that there were male prophets and female prophets in the early church. And, and then we see something very curious. Paul said that, that wives who prophesy with their head uncovered dishonor her head in 1 Corinthians 11.5. Will you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 14? So in that very same book, he then says a curious thing about prophecy and male headship. So 1 Corinthians 14.30 says this, But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. It's talking about order in worship. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. 
If they desire to learn something, anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of, of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, do not forbid the speaking in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. So what we see here is ladies who are prophesying, but then Paul says later in that same book that ladies are, not, are supposed to be silent in church. Now, we understand when it says ladies should be silent in church, it's not that ladies walk in with total silence and are not allowed to talk in the sanctuary. That would be nonsensical. This is describing orderliness in worship and, and, and speaking the word of God. And so what it's describing here is that when somebody is, is declaring the word of God, when somebody's declaring the word of God with authority, God has set up male elders, teaching elders, to do that, to fulfill that role. And so basically what he's saying here is, is that men are supposed to take that official role as teachers, and then ladies is saying who have questions about that should ask their husbands, who is has, who has the head of the marriage, is supposed to be able to uh, tell them the word of God, which is very important, men. And it tells us that we need to be ready with an answer for, for any question that our wives or children are going to be asking us. But we also see here that there were prophetesses. So how does this work, Paul? How does this work in the early church? Well, it seems very clear from chapter 21, as we hear from Agabus, a male prophet, that, that these prophets were prophesying the future, as Agabus will do here shortly. And so it looks like what was happening was that these prophetesses were in the same way prophesying the future, and they would do that sort of thing. And so what we had here was preaching elders were the ones to preach in church, and women could prophesy in whatever context God had called them to outside of that role. And, and there's a whole lot more questions that we have, but that's basically the, the, the long and the short of, of the simple statement. And so we have here these prophetesses, and there's all kinds of, of thoughts about what the role they had. There's even some people who think, as some of the early church historians wrote, that they had a part in prophesying from the Holy Spirit parts of the Scriptures. Uh, it's, it's, it's possible to verify that, but some people think that's why Luke included them at this point. But we want to turn here to the male prophet who's, act, who's going to make a prophecy at this point in verse 10. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So, in an Old Testament fashion, Agabus comes, and we've seen Agabus before because he's come to Antioch years previously, and he predicted by the Holy Spirit that there would be a famine in the land. And so this was recorded in Acts, and now we have Agabus who comes again by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and he uses a symbol, just like the prophets of the Old Testament. He uses a symbol. He takes Paul's belt, which was actually more like a girdle that would be wrapped around his tunic multiple times. And he takes that belt and he wraps himself in it. He ties, <clears throat> he binds himself like someone in chains. And so he binds himself and says, this is what's going to happen to you, Paul. Now, it's very interesting because he doesn't say you're going to die, Paul, but what he does say is there's going to be some kind of binding of you. There's going to be some kind of capture of you where you're going to be bound and, and possibly put in prison. And it's going to be the Gentiles that are going to do it, not the Jews, which is very interesting because he's going to Jerusalem, which is the main place where the Jews dwell. Now, the people take this as a sign from God that Paul is not to go. Notice then what, what ends up happening here. Verse 12, And when we had heard this, we as well as the local re residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. So the people took this as a sign that Paul was not to go. But then Paul says, why are you breaking my heart? And he decides to go anyways. Why did Paul go anyways? This was a prophecy of God. God was saying, you're gonna, if you go, you're going to be bound. And all of his brothers that were all around him and sisters, they were saying, don't go, Paul. Everybody, everybody but Paul was saying, don't go to Jerusalem. And yet he went. You see, Paul knew something, and that is this. Some guys, sometimes God tells us the future of hardship and pain over time so that we can handle it. Sometimes God prepares us incrementally for difficulty 
so that we can handle it and so that we know that it's God's will. If you were called by God to do something and you found it to be very difficult and you found resistance and you were persecuted and there was hardships, but you knew it was God's will, would you do it? If you knew it was God's will that those persecutions and hardships and difficulties were to come, would you do it? You see, God, when he calls us to things, doesn't just say, look, I'm just going to send you out and, and you're, you have no idea what's going to happen. There are times when he wants to prepare us for slow uh, difficulties or progressive difficulties in, in ways that we can handle. You see, if you knew every difficult thing that would happen in your life by following the will of God, I'm not sure you or I would do it. So isn't God gracious that he lets us know a little bit at a time, preparing us a little bit at a time? I, I think about this and, and, and my wife with pregnancies. You know, she's had eight children, but I still remember very well the first one. And we often talk about that that was, in some ways, this is, of course, her opinion. She's not here to defend herself. So I've got to be careful. But it was the easiest because when you have that first child, you don't really know the pain that's coming. You've never experienced it, right? So you just go through it. And then you get through it, you have the baby go, that was painful. And it got worse as time went by. Again, I don't know what that's like, but you ladies know exactly what it's like. And, and, and so what we've, my wife and I have talked about is the second one and the third one were more difficult because you knew. You knew what was coming. And we, we've dealt with that with anxiety about the actual birthing process and, and knowing the pain that was coming. And so you either do, you do one of two things. You either quit having kids, right? Or you, you do it one step at a time. You say, okay, we're just going to get through the first trimester, then the second trimester, then the third, and then the delivery, and all of that business. Because you know what's coming. You're prepared, but you know now that you know, you've got to take it incrementally. And that's what God does here with Paul. You see, we must expect that following God's will includes suffering at the hands of the enemies of God. It's going to have difficulties because there are enemies of God who do not want you to do God's will. Why? Well, we're involved in a cosmic battle. We have an enemy who wants to take you down and wants you to do anything but follow the will of God. Not only do you have an enemy outside in, in, in the form of Satan, but you have the world and the flesh inside of you that does not want you to follow the will of God and will prevent you from doing it every step of the way. And so it's a battle. And our enemy is out for blood. Our enemy is serious. He, he will persecute you. He will seek to harm you. He will seek to make your life difficult. So brothers and sisters, I ask you this morning, are we afraid of suffering for Christ? Are we afraid of suffering for Christ? And has that kept us from his will? Are we afraid of what would happen if we went and we preached the gospel to our neighbor? Are we afraid if we gave up more time to the service of the Lord, what would happen to our finances? Are we afraid to do what God has actually called us to do and are resisting the Holy Spirit because we're afraid of the pain we're afraid of the difficulty, and ultimately, we're afraid of dying. I can only speak for myself. I know that stepping into the pastorate, I had to make a decision that if I was going to be a pastor, that I would have to be willing to endure pain and suffering. That when I stepped out, because pastors throughout the church history have been the targets of the enemy. And so I knew that there would be difficulty. I knew that I could potentially be imprisoned for preaching from this pulpit. And brothers and sisters, I do believe a time is coming where I could very, very straightforwardly be uh, arrested for preaching Romans chapter 1, possibly even just reading it, and that would be determined as hate speech, and I would be breaking the law. And so I had to make that decision early on. Am I willing to be imprisoned with my family not having an income and, and taking that risk, trusting in the church to take care of my family while I'm in prison, just as John Bunyan was for so many years? I also had to decide 17 years ago when I became a pastor that if I was killed for Christ, I would still do what I do. If the threat of my own life came, that I would still do what I do. And so for you, Jesus is calling you and all of us to be ready to endure pain and death for the sake of Christ. I want you to just listen to Mark 8, what Jesus calls all of all disciples to. Verse 34, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. 
For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus from the get-go has told us that it's a hard road, but it's the road of life. Because when you give all for the sake of Christ, he gives you all. He get, not that you're earning it, but that you are so thankful for the eternal life that he has given you that this life pales in comparison. The good news is, even if they kill our body, we win. And so we're willing to give our body. Third point. People should not necessarily be listened to, especially when God's, cl- God's will is clear. Well, first, people should not necessarily be listened to. Notice what happens. Verse 12. And when he, we, we had heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. Remember, they loved Paul. Paul was a minister of the New Covenant. Much like Moses was a minister of the Old Covenant, as 2 Corinthians tells us, Paul was a main minister of the New Covenant. He was very important to the church. And the delegation that had come with him to bring the gift to Jerusalem did not want him to go, including Luke, because it actually says in verse 12, and we, and that includes Luke. He says even Luke was saying, Paul, don't go. Don't go to Jerusalem. Everybody told him not to go except him. And notice that Agabus didn't even tell him not to go. He just said, this is what's going to happen to you. But they all interpreted the message of God to say, don't go. Paul interpreted the message as, be prepared to suffer and die and go anyways. The lesson being, sometimes we get the message of God wrong. Sometimes we interpret the message of God wrongly, and we need to confirm it with the Lord, because if the Lord has called you to something, and, and, and someone else is calling you to something else, we need to follow the Lord above all. We must always check things with God. And so he gives them a, a, a gentle rebuke in verse 13. He says, he says why, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? It's like he's saying, why are you trying to get me to stray from God's will? God has called me to this. Why are you asking me to, to deny the, will, the call of God in my life? And so, and so it says then they finally give up and say, the Lord's will be done. Finally, they give in and they, go, they realize, I was wrong to try to dissuade you from going to Jerusalem. I need you, we all need to follow the Lord's will. Brothers and sisters, this is very important for us because when we instruct people, our young people, who are, have the call of God in their lives, when we instruct our family members, when we instruct our friends, we need to be very cautious about what we say because God may be calling them something dangerous and if we dissuade them from that because it is dangerous, it does have risks, we may be opposing the will of God. especially when God's will is clear, or specifically when God's will is clear. And that's the emphasis on the clear will of God. Some people take this too far, and they don't listen to anyone, even if they have good advice or they have the directions, this direction by the Holy Spirit. I've seen people who wanted to be missionaries, who felt called by God, and the people around them were Christians saw clearly that this was not the right thing to do, that they were not ready, they weren't strong enough in their faith, or they weren't mature enough, and they headed out, and I've seen them crash and burn in ministry, because they didn't listen to the leaders in their life. And so God does put leaders in our lives to be able to give us advice. As Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. There's a lot to unpack there, but basically what it's saying is, is God has placed shepherds in your life to give you advice, and generally speaking, you should listen to them. Here's the caveat unless it goes against God's will. And if it does go against God's will, follow the Lord. Because people make mistakes. If God has directed you clearly to follow his will, by all means, follow his will. And that's what Paul did in verse 14. He decided to go, and since he would not be persuaded, verse 14, he would not be persuaded by these other people in his life because he was persuaded by God, and they finally says, the will of of the Lord be done. So I ask, in conclusion, those questions again. What is God's will for your life? And how has God directed you to accomplish his will? 
Have you avoided doing God's will because he has warned you? And you've taken that as a message to not do his will? Have you avoided doing God's will because you're afraid to suffer or give something up? Are you more concerned about the opinions of those around you than the will of God? Are you listening to God's direction for you or other people's? Brothers and sisters, as we close, I want to encourage you with this. As you follow the will of God, your survival and your victory are assured. Someone who has those issues settled is a dangerous weapon in the hands of God. Once you recognize you have nothing of value to lose and everything of value to gain, you will be unstoppable. The world will shake and this community will be rocked by just one person who is willing to do all the will of God. And I pray it's not just one. I pray it's all. Amen? Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray that because of the gospel, the salvation we have of eternal life in Jesus, that we would be willing to do your will. We would be willing to follow you to the wall. And Lord, I pray that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit to recognize what we have in Jesus. The death and resurrection of Christ means the death of our sin to ourselves and the resurrection to new life both a a life of new living now and a new body in the future. I pray, Lord, that that truth transforms our desires, Lord, helps us to know that life is not about just survival. It's about more. And I pray, Lord, you would guide us to specifically whatever that will is. And for anyone here today who doesn't know the will of God, doesn't know your will, I pray that you would show them, Lord. And I pray that their hearts would be receptive. Lead us, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's let's stand and sing together.
Oh, 
again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. There's offering plates in the back. If you would like to drop off your offering there, there's some ushers who are ready for you. There's also photos in the chapel here for our directory, so please stop by, take a photo, so that you can have a photo for your directory. And if we end up canceling service for the next few weeks, be looking at the church website because we'll still have messages. They'll still be posted. We're going to keep teaching the Word of the Lord. Amen? May God's grace and peace be with you. You're dismissed. Amen.